I would like to introduce our next speaker from industry, Dr. Paramapal. Dr. Paramapal is a senior scientist with TCS Research, Tata Consultancy Services. Her current research interests include data-driven models for engineered composites as well as novel optical sensing paradigms applied to diverse horizontals. Prior to this, she has held positions in Robert Bosch Engineering and Business Solutions and the Robert Bosch Center for Cyber Physical Systems at the Indian Institute of Science. She has an MSc in Physics from IIT Delhi and PhD in Optics from the Institute of Optics, University of Rochester, USA. Please welcome Dr. Paramapal, who will be speaking to us on path to success in industry. Good afternoon, everybody. So I have this uh, bad habit of still asking if I'm audible or not, thanks to all the Zoom and Google Meet meetings. Um, I also have a very sore throat today, so I hope my voice will not give out as I speak. Um, I also have the rather non-enviable uh, sort of I'm in this position where you're all ready for lunch, blood sugars are running low, and uh, I will try to wrap up in 10 minutes because I think there's, there have been so many stalwarts who've spoken ahead of me and who've touched upon, um, you know, aspects of leadership, um, <coughs> aspects of how gender equity plays a role in, um, towards achieving your aspirational goals. Um, I don't want to repeat uh, any of that, so I'll try to, I'll try to condense my talk. Okay? Okay, so I'm sure everybody's heard of TCS, right? How many of you know that we actually have a pretty flourishing corporate research division? Yeah, not a lot of, not a lot of hands, right? You've all gotten your passports renewed through TCS Eseva Kendra and stuff like that. But a lot of, um, a lot of research outcomes have actually even gone into see a lot of the TCS solutions um, and products that you use today in uh, many walks of life have had a contribution from people with you know, backgrounds such as yours, PhDs and so on. And uh, so just, just to give you a very, very brief overview, um, uh, TCS is of course one of the world's largest IT consulting practices. And um, the research division uh, in particular was started in the early 80s. So it's been around for a while. Uh, it was known as uh, TRDDC. I don't know how many of you have heard of the Data Research Design and Development Center. And today there are many, many research programs and research areas that are uh, funded by TCS. So, um, whoops, let's see. Software systems and devices, foundations of computing, robotics, physical sciences, um, data and decision sciences, life sciences, etc. The idea is that, um, I mean, the mandate is to explore emerging technologies that can drive future capabilities and can generate impact, right, for, for, for customers, as well as for society at large. So just some statistics. Um, we have about 12 research areas as of now, um, nine research programs that are more, uh, more business oriented. Um, we have over 6,000 people, employees, that we count as part of the research community, okay. Um, about 250 PhDs, last count, okay? Um, and R&D spend in the last fiscal year was about $260 million, so it's sizable. Many, many startup partners, many, many academic partners as well, okay? All right, so just, just very briefly, uh, this is the work that my team does. I lead a small team of, uh, data scientists as well as optical engineers and mechanical engineers. Um, and, um, you know, lately we've been exploring a lot of uh, uh, AI for um, intelligent design of metamaterials. Any metamaterial researchers out here? Yep, yeah, there we go. Um, we also have uh, some sustainability driven projects. So there's this very major initiative um, within TCS research to develop a digital twin for food. Right, you would have heard of digital twins of driving uh, enterprise innovation and so on. So this is basically um, a combination of multimodal sensing, uh, AI models. It's a very, it's a full stack technology level solution, uh, which is meant to reroute, repurpose, recycle, and reprice food 
keeping in mind the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And of course, optical imaging is, 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 a, is an important component towards building some of those models. Uh, we've done work for sensing, we've done work for metrology, we did a very big project with Tata Steel a couple of years back, you know, right before the pandemic hit. Uh, we do work with the robotics team, so it's, it's very multidisciplinary. So I think optics, right, is, is very multidisciplinary in, the, in nature. And this, I mean, this comes into, I, th I think the industry is where you exploit that the most, because it's not about, you know, what you did your thesis in and you consistently keep doing that same thing over and over again. You are asked to pivot to new things very often, you know. Yesterday, there's a client from manufacturing. Tomorrow, there's a client from health science, you know, from life sciences. So how do you, how do you pivot? So there's a little bit of my journey. So I must say, when I was first asked, asked to, you know, talk about uh, the path to success in the industry, I, I must say, I was like, uh, I don't know if I'm really qualified to talk about this. Um, uh, and I, I I, I was almost going to write to Urbashi and say, you know, please, you know, wait, can I can I speak about something else, maybe something more technical? And then I think there was an email from her where she said, no, no, you must uh, kind of stick to this this part of the theme. So anyway, so a little bit of uh, my journey is, uh, of course, as uh, uh, as you uh, you know, as per the introduction you gave. I finished my PhD in 2009. I'm sorry, my dates are all there. You can all guess how old I am. But, uh, uh, you know, I worked um, uh, um, at the Institute of Optics. It's the oldest school of optics in the US. And my thesis was on studying nonlinear effects in optical fibers. I don't do any of that today. So, um, and then I went on to do a postdoc from the Harvard Medical School. I was at the Wellman Center for Photomedicine. Um, and then, of course, I came to Bosch, and then uh, as of, you know, five and a half years back, I've been, I've been a part of TCS research. So how many of you, how many of you are students still here? All right, as expected, a large majority, overwhelming majority. How many of you have industry aspirations? Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Um, why? Can one of you can one of you tell me why 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 do you want to be in the industry? A lot of opportunities for. Okay. Um, more than an academia. Important I mean, in single topic only. Uh huh. So in I think in industry we. That's interesting. I would counter that by saying in the industry, you have to work on things that bring money to the company. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, of course, when you're in school, you have, uh, you know, there's decisions to be made all the time. What courses do I take? What lab do I join? Do I do a thesis that's mostly experimental in nature or mostly theoretical in nature? So when I was a graduate student, I was told, you know, do something that's heavily experimental because if you want to go into the industry, that's what they're looking for. I must say it's flipped completely now, right? It, I mean, right now, a lot of openings, a lot of job postings require you to be good at simulations, to be good at modeling. So it's very dynamic in nature. So of course, the biggest dilemma is, you know, do I want to be in the academia? Do I want to be in the industry? And um, one of the biggest misconceptions is that they're both very different uh, beasts. They're not. There is no abyss between them. A lot of the learnings that you apply towards a successful academic career, you have to apply to a successful industry career as well and vice versa. And so today you have professors who are turning into entrepreneurs and um, you know, starting up companies, uh, whereas you also have leading corporate researchers who are also holding faculty positions. Right? They have adjunct roles, they're teaching in institutes, and so on. Um, one of the things, and I think because Professor Jansen is here, I must say this, uh, when I was a student, there was a lot of encouragement to participate, uh, to be 
um, uh, you know, active members of professional organizations. I must say one of my biggest goof ups was that I thought it was a massive waste of time. It's not a massive waste of time. It's, it's, it's a very good thing to do, especially if you have industry aspirations, because the network um, that you can create by participating in these organizations, you know, they help you to land very good internships. They, um, you know, help you to keep track of industry trends and inside information. It's not just conferences. Conferences still tend to be very academic in nature. Okay. And then, of course, you, you uh, sort of enhance on your overall credibility as a professional. Okay. And, uh, of course, the thing about networking is, you know, it's got the word work in it. So networking is as much about giving as it is about getting. So you have to, you have to volunteer, you have to contribute in whatever way you can for people to value you and, and give you something back in return, okay? So this is a poster that I took from the SPIE website. And of course, you know, once you're done with your education, there are so many options that are available to you. Uh, if you're trained in optics and photonics, right? I mean, it's like I won't even attempt to read through them, but it, it you know, there's, lo there's lots of things that you can do. So this is kind of the um, typical, I wouldn't say it's the, you know, the corporate research ladder that you have to climb uh, during your profession, but it's more like a framework because a ladder implies that there's only, you take one step and the next and the next, but a framework, it sort of implies that there are many paths towards reaching uh, your end goal, right? So if you have to grow in the industry, you know, of course you come in young, yeah, either as an intern or, you know, we call them developers or technicians or engineers or research associates. And this is kind of the easiest part, right? Because you, you're hired because you're good in one particular thing or two, you know, one or two particular things. So your core technical skills are at play here. But as you start to mature and as you start to grow, you're expected to take on more and more leadership roles, right? It's really not, and especially by the time you get to the top of the ladder, it, it sometimes has very little to do with what you were originally trained in, right? And it's more to do about how you are as a visionary. Um, can you do a technical road mapping? How good you are? Uh, as a strategic leader, you have to generate profits for your company. You have to make your company grow. And so, you know, sometimes that has absolutely no correlation with what you did for your thesis, for example. Okay. There has to be a good amount of thought leadership that you have to develop and so on. So I would say, yeah, so I'm, you know, somewhere here. So, you know, we are scientists, senior scientists, principal scientists. We lead teams. We manage teams. Professors also do that, right, when they're managing their students and their labs. So again, they're not two completely different things. And of course, um, when you're young, in a big organization, let's say TCS, 600 and, 650,000 employees, I think, as of this year, right? Um, let's see what the recession will do to us, but anyway. Um, you have to sort of think like an entrepreneur. And when, what that means is you, have to, you can come up with new and innovative ideas, but your ideas have to, have to involve the competencies and resources that are around you, right? So you cannot go into a consulting firm and say, you know, I want to build all these fabulous satellites that will do this, you know, whatever, you know, some, some, some very, uh, iconoclastic uh, sort of communication network if, if your company is not in that. So that is where academia still wins because if you can write a convincing proposal, someone will fund you for that, right? But in a, but in a company, they will not. And so a lot of this opportunity creation has to do with communication. So you've all, I think you all spoke about um, in the workshop earlier today about how good it is to communicate. And you have to do that consistently in the industry because you're always having to convince people. You're having to convince your team members that the work that you're giving them has value. You have to convince your managers that what you're doing has value. You have to convince uh, your peers. You have to convince internal stakeholders so that you know, budgets come to execute your vision and so on. How much time do I have? 1.30. 
seven minutes. Well, okay, seven habits for success in seven minutes. I won't go through all of that. Um, one of the other things about leadership that is not intuitive is, you know, um, there are very good managers who spend a lot of time with their team, right? And they'll be mentoring them and handholding them, assigning tasks, assigning roles, trying to grow them as leaders themselves. And actually, that's kind of limiting. What you really want to be, you don't want to be a hub. So there's the so-called hub, you know, uh, hub model for being a manager and a bridge model. And to be a bridge, what you have to do is you have to make sure that you, people who work for you are also, you know, working consistently with goals that align with organizational goals. Like right? you can't be giving them tasks that take them nowhere. They might be doing it really well, but they won't really be appreciated in the long run. You have to get, you have to funnel critical information into the team. You cannot be insular. You cannot say, you know, this is my little kingdom. And, you know, because I've been given the title of manager, I, I control what you do. And then, you know, uh, you, you cannot think that way. Uh, you have to grow your people. I think this is one of the, um, it's often touted as one of the big differences with academia. And that is in academia, you, it's still a lot about personal achievement, personal laurels, winning awards, and so on. I mean, everybody appreciates the 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 roles that their students have played, you know, in that journey. But in, a, in, in, a, in the industry, it's really about how well your team does. Your team does well, your team says th good things about you as a mentor, you will grow, right? If your team does badly, you failed. So you have to sort of raise people, you know, up, you know, your direct reports, you have to give them visibility as well. So this is an excellent book that um, I don't know how many uh, how many of you have heard of this book. This is quite famous. You've heard of this, yeah. So it's by this uh, a professor called Herminia Ibarra. I think she was a professor at the Harvard Business School when she wrote this. Uh, she's moved on to London Business School, I think, and she you know operates on this principle of developing outside as opposed to inside. And basically, the key takeaways are I mean I, I guess because I'm running out of time is that it's not so much about your domain knowledge. See, you're hired because everyone agrees that you understand what you have done very well, you're very good at it, you understand your domain. Um, but now it's all about developing your external knowledge, you know, uh, developing competencies outside of what you've been trained in. And then uh, it's about new experiences, which also ties into that. And the, and the final thing is about acting like a leader. See, in you, when you do science, it's a lot about, you know, it's the thinking and the introspection that comes first, and then the action comes after. But when you have to grow in the industry, one of the things that you, we unlearn is that you have to act, especially because you are operating in a condition of very high ambiguity, right? Your budgets can get slashed within a quarter. Your team can, you know, undergo heavy attrition, right? You're leading a team of six people, four leave for an Amazon job. What are you going to do, right? Um, you know, recessions come, recessions go, management changes. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of ambiguity. Uh, I wouldn't use the word instability. That's just the nature of being in the industry, right? So you have to constantly act. You cannot be thinking all the time. And if you think all the time, you tend to miss the boat. Right. That's happened to a lot of companies that have been leaders in a particular technology. They've missed the boat when a newer, more disruptive technology has come along. Right. OK. Um, again, when you interview for senior roles, which will happen in a few years after you've been in the industry, you will constantly be asked of, you know, how which leadership muscles you flexed right? You know, even as a technical leader. And um, I won't go into all of these. I think a lot of the speakers have spoken about different aspects before. But I would like to speak about the competency trap. Do you know what the competency trap is? So there's this very vicious feedback circle of, I'm very good at something. I do more of it. I became, uh, become even better at it. You know, I, I feel even better about myself because now I'm becoming more and more of an expert. 
and so I keep doing the same thing again and again and again. That's the competency trap. Doesn't apply to academia. When you're in academia, you can do, you know, you're, you're known for a few things and you can keep doing that for decades and decades. You can still breach new frontiers. I'm not saying they, they're, they're stagnant. But in the industry, you have got to avoid being caught in a competency trap. Because one day you will be obsolete, right? You don't, you don't want that to happen. Okay, then there's a, a lot about networking. Uh, again, um, it's very important to network. Um, there are some traps that sort of prevent you from expanding your network. One of those traps is you think networking is not real work, right? I don't have time to schmooze. I'm doing science, you know. Um, I don't want to use people. I feel like I'm making friends just to use them, you know, in, in future. And I have them say nice things about me. The other trap is, you, you know, the payoff towards networking is very long term. You know, you don't really see benefits in the short term. Uh, it's not like you make friends with somebody, you get a job offer in six months. It doesn't happen like that. And you also think that relationships should form spontaneously. You know, I shouldn't have to work towards having a good network. But the idea, but the, the reality is that you do have to work to develop a, a, a strong network, okay? And lastly, I think I have like one or two more slides, so yeah, almost done. Uh, lastly, outside is about redefining yourself, right? So we've talked about how you can redefine your role, redefine your network. The last thing is about redefining yourself, and there's this very humorous quote from a, a, a famous writer called Wilson Meisner who says, if you copy from one author, it's plagiarism, but if you copy from many, it's research, right? So it's about who you choose as your mentors and how you emulate them. Do you just copy them? Do you copy their mannerisms? Do you copy their personalities? Or do you, I mean, you know, so there's this concept of doing a good theft and a bad theft. So you have to steal like an artist, is what they say, which is that you honor your mentors. You don't degrade them by, by, by just copying them or just sort of, you know, doing a caricature of them. You steal from many. You don't steal from just one. So again, relates to this quote. Um, you have to credit them, right? You have to, you, you, can't, you cannot plagiarize. If you're doing something someone's done before you and you're doing it because you liked it, you have to give proper credit. And uh, you don't do a rip off, you do, you, you do a remix. You do something that, you know, people still enjoy. And um, you don't stick to your story. Again, this is very difficult for people coming from very scientific backgrounds. Um, you know, to kind of recontextualize what we are doing for different people. You have a technology. Today, you're selling it to a semiconductor company. Tomorrow, you're selling it to a textile company. Next week, you're talking about how your models apply to banking and financial services. It's the same thing, right? But you have to contextualize it. So you, you cannot be, you know, you can't stick to your story. You have to be a chameleon. I think one of the best examples of a chameleon is supposed to be apparently the former president, Barack Obama, because he would take the same thing, but depending on who was in the room, he would twist it completely. I'm not saying you fabricate. I'm saying you contextualize, okay? So there's a difference. And so, yeah, so all of this time, I've really not talked about the gender aspects because there have been so many excellent speakers before me who have. But um, there's one quote, I think, from Indra Nui, which was very, uh, very appropriate. And she said that, don't wait to be invited to sit at the table. Pull up a chair and sit at the table yourself. You know, you think I'll do good work and people will notice me and give me credit. Doesn't happen, right? So speak up, be very vocal about uh, what you have achieved. Um, don't be shy, don't be afraid to seek the truth and don't be afraid to speak the truth. Right? You're in a, a room full of very aggressive male leaders and they're talking about something that you, th you know is incorrect. There are ways of pointing it out, right? And gender equality needs the support of both men and women. Again, we've talked about that uh, before in this session. So lean in. You, know. um, you have nothing to lose by doing that. And uh, yeah, that, uh, so there are some other key, 
key takeaways. I'm not going to read through this. But uh, this is my favorite quote about being a powerful leader, right? It's from Swami Vivekananda who said, be the servant by leading, be unselfish, have infinite patience and success is yours. Okay. So applies everywhere. Doesn't matter if it's the industry or the academia, right? So that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you.